Chapter 11.2, lesson number three now. We want to take a look at something called calorimetry. Again, we did do this back in the climate unit. Um, depending upon uh, how in-depth your teacher got with it, you may have actually even done this lab, in which we had something known as a simple coffee cup calorimeter. All right, why a coffee cup calorimeter? Well, those styrofoam coffee cups are very, very good at insulating, which means they're really good at holding on to heat. Um, they're dirt cheap, so they're cheaper than thermoses, stuff like that, and uh, they're easily modified to have all the things we need to make our measurements. So our most simple cal uh, calorimeter here is this nested polystyrene cups, those foam uh, environmentally damaging cups that we will use. Uh, we'll have a couple things that we'll also need with it, a lid to help further insulate this and retain heat, and of course a thermometer so that we can measure temperature changes of heating up or cooling down. Because remember, Q is heat, which is a change in the thermal energy or the kinetic energy of the particles of your substance. So calorimetry is the term that we give uh, to this for a way of measuring and getting empirical data on enthalpy changes. So there's your delta uh, EK, all right, or your Q. And so we're going to do this of a various system. What is our system? All right, our system is usually the chemical reaction that we are studying. And so system just becomes a nice, easy way of referring to it. As we take a look at this, you can see the design. We have our nested cups. They're there to, number one, uh, isolate whatever you're studying on the inside from the outside, and two, insulate it so that we don't have any thermal energy changes leaving the calorimeter or getting in. So we only want to know the energy change between uh, what's going to be called the system and the surroundings. Okay. It's based upon uh, two laws of thermodynamics, and you've heard them before. Energy can't be created or destroyed. So in this case, we're looking at energy uh, being prevented from entering or leaving the calorimeter. In other words, we are going to assume that it is a perfect thermos. If you think about what a thermos does, you put your delicious coffee into your thermos. When it's piping hot, fresh out of the coffee maker, you throw it into your thermos. Uh, to go on your little fishing trip or whatever you're going to go do, and you're hoping that the coffee is still exactly piping hot by the time you get there. We know that the thermos isn't perfect, all right? By tomorrow or the next day, your coffee will be cold or at room temperature at least as it has come to equilibrium, but a thermos is a very highly designed uh, device in order to, well, insulate your coffee and prevent those temperature changes. We also know that our heat or energy here, all right, spontaneously transfers from areas of high temperature to cold temperatures. So we're always going from hot to cold, like we did with that little hand example in an earlier video. So here we have just a schematic taking a look at a calorimeter here. We have situation A, in which we're taking a look at the system here, which is an exothermic process. Remember, exothermic processes or exothermic reactions. Um, give off energy. And so what we're trying to do with our calorimeter is design where that energy can go. And so what we'll do is we'll have a solution known as the surroundings, usually water. And so if I have an exothermic chemical reaction that loses thermal energy or loses heat, then that heat has to go to the surroundings, which is the water surrounding this. Run it uh, a chemical reaction in solution, mix the two solutions together if you wish. If it's an exothermic process, then the water or the solvent of that solution should heat up. And so we see that the process we have is lost energy. The surroundings that we are measuring with our thermometer here has gained energy. And we see that the temperature of our solution goes up. We make assumptions that this is a perfect thermos. So whatever energy was lost by the process is exactly the same energy gained by the surroundings. And so we can make that relationship. If, however, here in situation B, we have an endothermic process. Remember, endothermic processes feel cold because they steal energy from the surroundings. And so as Q is input into this system to feed its endothermic needs, 
then it must be the surroundings that supply that energy. And so now your solution, known as the surroundings, or the water in your calorimeter, loses thermal energy or loses heat, then we must see this as a temperature decrease as it cools down. Okay, so we have two places here, the system and the surroundings, and a calorimeter is designed to isolate the exchange of energy between the two things. And so we get to assume that Q surroundings is equal to Q system. All right, but as one goes up, the other must go down. So here's our rules and our assumptions that I hope you read in the textbook from the last, uh, uh, the last bit of homework and assignment that you guys had. When using the calorimeter to measure these energy changes, we must make a few assumptions here. So we have to define how the calorimeter works. Number one, the system is defined as an isolated system. This means, again, we are assuming that perfect thermos. Okay, energy can only be transferred between the system, the chemical reaction that you are studying, and the surroundings, likely the water that is in your calorimeter or the solution solvent, which again is the water that you use to make your solution with. The system is what you are studying. There is no little probe or device or thermometer that you can stick into all of the atoms of a chemical reaction. All right, that's just not something we're able to do. But we can take a look at what that chemical reaction does to the water that you filled your calorimeter with. So that is the system. And so we can measure this system. This is what we can observe and get numbers for and infer it as to what is taking place in the system or um, the substance or chemical uh, reactants that are undergoing this enthalpy change or this change in heat and energy. Thermal energy is transferred to those polystyrene cups, the thermometer, the lid, and the outside uh, environment. It does happen. So this is not a perfect thermos, but it is usually so small it is safe to ignore. So, so long as you are being quick and efficient with your calorimetry measurements and experiments, then what you will find is that the losses to everything else that is not the solution or your surroundings, all right, is usually safe to ignore. So, we will summarize this as a bit of an equation here uh, after we make a couple more assumptions, okay? Most of the uh, uh, chemical reactions that we do, if you remember from Chem 20, take place in solution. This is why we call chemistry a wet science, because most of the things that we can do easily and efficiently take place by actually dealing with chemical solutions. Most of our solutions are fairly dilute, which means they are mostly water, so it is safe to assume that your solutions will have the same specific heat capacity as just plain water. If they do not, then we will have to tell you a new specific heat capacity. And a good example of this would be the antifreeze or the ethylene glycol that you might put into the radiator of your car. All right, that is a solution of ethylene glycol and mostly water. But unfortunately, ethylene glycol does change the specific heat capacity of water, and so we would have to give you that information if we were to do something different. But unless you were told otherwise... All solutions are assumed to have the same specific heat capacity of water of 4.19 joules per gram degree C. The lid is not airtight, so this happens at constant pressure, otherwise known uh, as an open system if we think back to our gas laws. All right, so there we go. We have another picture of our coffee cup calorimeter. We have our sample or our system here. We have the water surroundings, and Q is either going to the surroundings or to your sample, if it's exo or endothermic. So, using these assumptions, we can actually make an equation here. The energy transfer that you have must be equal to the enthalpy change for your reaction. And delta H is the symbol that we use for enthalpy or thermal energy changes for a chemical reaction or chemical equation. So we assume that our calorimeter is 100% efficient. If it is not, like you saw in one of the practice questions uh, previously, then we will have to tell you and give you some extra information to work. So this means in most cases, these two things, because they must be uh, equal and opposite, must add up to zero. So as one increases, the other one must decrease. So we can simplify this as Q is equal to negative delta H, 
or delta H is equal to negative Q. So here's our assumption. This is an equation that we are making based upon how we defined the calorimeter. The thermal energy that is released or gained by the system, your chemical reaction, is known as delta H. This must be equal and opposite to the thermal energy absorbed or lost by the surroundings. So if your process or your system here is exothermic and gives up energy, then your surroundings must absorb that same quantum or bundle of energy. Okay? And so we can say that they are equal and opposite because as one loses exothermic, the other must gain. So your potential energy system, uh, potential energy changes of the system are equal and opposite to the kinetic energy changes for your surroundings, what is heating up or cooling down. And so delta H, all right, the energy changes of chemical reaction that can't be directly measured can be assumed to be equal in number, just opposite to the temperature change that we observed for your surroundings. And so this all kind of summarizes here. If a chemical reaction releases energy, called an exothermic reaction, it should have a loss of energy as this takes place. Because remember, exothermic reactions give off energy. This must therefore cause the solution in your calorimeter heat up by the exact same number, Q, and so we get that equal and opposite nature. So the positive and negative here is just to show that as one energy is lost, the other energy is gained. So if your chemical reaction absorbs energy, otherwise known as endothermic, we should see an increase in its delta H, but this causes the calorimeter to lose heat, and we should see the temperature drop and the heat lost by the surroundings or the solution. Okay, got some examples on the next page. We'll put those into the next lesson uh, for 11.2.